Hello and welcome back to the series on neural networks for the purposes of the digital humanities. Now in the last video we looked at prediction and the video before that we looked at other concepts important to neural networks such as validation, testing, loss, weights, activation functions, etc. In this video we're going to step back and take a, a broader look at neural networks, some of the types of neural networks that exist. We're going to look at a few of them and the kind of problems that they're used to solve. So let's go ahead and look at this image. Here we have a list, uh, mostly complete list, of neural networks compiled by, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this name, Fyodor von Wien, uh, and I have the citation right up here, that's why this image is nice, so you all can kind of go to his site and grab this image for yourself. But what we have is a list of different types of neural networks. The reason why this image is so useful is because it doesn't just show you the general architecture, it actually has a nice chart for what the different neurons, the nodes in the neural network charts are actually doing. Now, we've really kind of dealt with just the basics of neural networks, and I am not going to get into all of these more complicated ones, such as general adversarial neural networks. I might by the end of this video, but for the most part, I'm just putting this chart up there so that you can see the different types, the wide array of neural networks that exist, that scholars who specialize in machine learning have figured out how to create to solve very specific problems. So one of the things I want to do in this video is just give you a sense of some of the ones that we're going to see in this series and uh, kind of why they're going to be useful to solve certain specific issues. So let's jump right in. The first one I want to talk about is a typical forward-feeding neural network. Now these can be shallow or deep forward-feeding and they're used to solve different tasks. So you will typically use a shallow neural network that's just simple forward feeding. This is very basic stuff. It's in which all the previous neurons or nodes are connected to the all uh, the next set of neurons or nodes, and it moves forward in through the neural network. So it moves in this direction, meaning that the, it goes from input to first hidden layer to second hidden layer to eventually getting to the output layer. Now, these neural networks architectures are what we're going to use for binary text classification. As we get into multi-class text classification, we're going to change the architecture a little bit and make it more of a deep uh, feed-forward neural network as opposed to a shallow one. So feed-forward are really good for kind of solving general problems, and I have found in the past that it's nice kind of starting with a simple architecture and making it more complex as necessary when trying to perform text classification. The next kind of neural network that we want to look at is one known as a convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network are really useful, these are also called CNNs, are very useful for actually solving image-based problems. What convolutional layers do that's different from a typical uh, like dense layer in Keras or TensorFlow is going to be the way in which they iterate across the data. So in a normal neural network, the neuron will act upon the input data of X size. A convolutional layer will actually iterate across an image in a predetermined matrix of information, so matrix of pixels. And that allows it to be really good at identifying and extracting different features of an image. It allows for the neural network to kind of look at an image piece by piece, break it down, and each uh, neuron or node being able to kind of become familiar with and being able to activate at a higher level depending on if that feature is found. This is going to make a lot more sense when we get to part three of this series when we start exploring image classification. That's going to be what we're using, convolutional neural networks. The other type of neural network I think it's worth kind of mentioning, and I'm not sure we're going to get to it in this series, is recurrent neural networks. I might get to it if there is an interest. Recurrent neural networks are very useful for kind of um, audio-based problems. So they're really good at sequencing audio information. And the reason why is because of how they actually uh, work that's different. Now, if you notice that this one's got a recurrent cell, and what the recurrent neural network is able to do is instead of actually just going from the beginning to the output, it's able to loop information back into a neuron. So it's able to iterate the information and store it in memory and go back to it uh, at a, a, and later in that iteration, or it's able to take a later hidden layer and send information backwards and re, uh, allows it to kind of go back over that same data again after a specific calculation is done on this layer. Again, those are going to make more sense if we actually start using them and explaining them. 
but this gives you a sense that there's other types of neural networks out there that are not simply forward feeding. Another kind of neural network that really has become popular is this idea of LSTM, or long short-term memory. Now, long short-term memory is different in the way that it retains information. These are oftentimes used in conjunction with uh, convolutional layers because they are really good at processing sequential data. So data where past information is important to understand the present and therefore is even more important to predict the future. So think about the stock market. A past stock market is essential to understand if you are going to be processing data from a present stock market in the hopes that you can make some kind of future prediction on a future stock market. This is also very useful when you're trying to predict the weather. Past weather experiences need to be understood in order to understand present weather conditions so that you can predict what is going to happen with a storm or a hurricane, what have you, in the future. So long short-term uh, memory cells are very useful for uh, doing this kind of information because they allow you to retain information from past iterations and then use that information in a current uh, iteration to make a future prediction. So that's why long, uh, short-term memory neural networks, that's how they're useful and how they're kind of used. The problem with them is that they're computationally and memory-based very, uh, very uh, expensive. And so oftentimes it is encouraged to try to solve the problem using a convolutional neural network layer. And a lot of times that will be possible. So that's one kind of example. And I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'll talk about it anyway. Generative adversarial networks are kind of one of my favorite things. The way a generative adversarial network, or GAN, works is it takes in the data, and then in the middle of the data, we have this, if you look up here, match input output cell. What does this mean? Well, it outputs something, and then what the next half of the neural network tries to do is it tries to uh, basically create a forgery of that item. So why would this be useful? Well, this is actually extremely useful for image generation. So if you've heard about deep fakes that are circulating the web, this is how deep fakes work. You have one neural network that tries to understand the features of an image and it gets to this output layer and it outputs what it thinks that the image is. And then what the input layer does over here is it takes in that image and then tries to output a fake of it. And the initial iterations of this process are very, very bad. But after they run hundreds of thousands of times, the forger part of the neural network, this part here, is actually able to generate images that are so convincingly accurate that the input layer here is actually very bad at figuring out if it's a fake or if it's real. And so the way generative adversarial networks work is think of them as one of them being an analyzer of images and one of them being a forger of images. And so what you're able to do is get a network that is trained by another network. And this is really useful for, like I said, doing uh, generating new data. So such as uh, what they're typically used for right now is images. But this can also be used to generate forgeries of texts as well. So these are some of the types of neural networks that are out there, what they're kind of used for. Um, really what I'm trying to do in this series is just introduce you to uh, neural networks generally so that you can take these skills and apply them to your domain specific problems. That's going to be it for this video. In the next two videos, we're going to start looking at TensorFlow and Keras so that we can start using TensorFlow on Keras in part two of this series for text classifications. That's going to be it for now, though. Thank you for listening. And if you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe down below.